Um, so we did a study uh, not too long ago looking at the most common causes of eye pain in our department, uh, as well as an ophthalmology department in Switzerland. And then we looked at the causes of, you know, when people were presenting with a primary complaint of eye pain in our neurology clinic here at Utah, and then also at the neurology clinics at the University of uh, Switzerland. And so um, in the um, neurology clinic, the most common root cause of people presenting with eye pain uh, was headache and migraine, no surprise there, optic neuritis, uh, a distant second, and then these other, you know, miscellaneous causes like trigeminal neuralgia, and then some ophthalmic things like dry eye and blepharitis, but, you know, far and away it was migraine and headache. Um, in the ophthalmology clinic, we usually, you know, if somebody comes in and says their eye hurts, we really depend on the eye exam to tell us, you know, what's wrong. You know, we can look in there and we can see that they have blepharitis or that they have a corneal abrasion or that they have anterior chamber cell or whatever. But, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like 80% um, of the time we're able to make a diagnosis just based on our exam without asking any questions of the patient. Uh, but we're all really stuck when the eye is quiet and the patient is complaining of eye pain. And so uh, in my comprehensive eye clinic, um, just from my personal experience, not my neuro clinic, but my general ophthalmology clinic, the most common cause, again, for me is, is migraine. And it's, you know, and I think that's because of the wiring of the trigeminal nerve. I also see a fair number of people who have cervical paraspinal muscle spasm, like from a whiplash injury that have referred pain into their eye. And then, you know, you know, way, way, way out in third place is myositis and surface issues like, you know, dry eye and blepharitis and junk like that. And, and, and that's in people with a, you know, with a quiet eye. So then what do you do? Well, it turns out that, you know, the nerve that's supposedly irritated in migraine, the trigeminal nerve is also the nerve that supplies sensation to the eye and the eye socket and the eye muscles and the periorbital structures, you know, so it's all connected. And so I don't think it's surprising that some people with migraine, uh, um, you know, have it manifest as eye pain instead of a usual, a usual headache. And if you stimulate different parts of the dura, which is also, which are also innervated by the trigeminal nerve, you can get referred pain to all these wacky places on your scalp and face. And so you can see again how, um, you know, if you irritate the trigeminal nerve in a certain region, it can be perceived by the patient as pain in or around the eye. So remember, migraine is incredibly common, almost 20% of women. So like you know, if five women walk into your general clinic, like on average, you know, one of them is going to have migraine, 6% of men. Um, so, you know, a lot of people wonder if they maybe have migraines. And so they're usually characterized by a unilateral throbbing headache. The headaches are usually characterized by light sensitivity and sound sensitivity and nausea, but not always. Um, there's often a family history, but you have to really go digging for it. Um, Many people um, are often misdiagnosed with some other headache syndrome or they're undiagnosed completely. Sometimes there's a childhood history of car sickness or unexplained episodic belly pain. And those people are sometimes um, uh, thought to be, that's thought to be like a childhood manifestation of migraine that in adulthood presents, you know, more of a typical headache that we think of. Some people call this episodic belly pain in childhood an abdominal migraine, like the the visceral nervous system, you know, somehow gets caught up in the migraine pathophysiology. Um, if you want a quick way to figure out if somebody in your office has migraine, you can use the three question ID migraine questionnaire. And then you can ask, has a headache limited your activities for a day or more in the last three months? Are you ever nauseated or sick to your stomach when you have a headache? Does light ever bother you when you have a headache? If somebody answers, 
yes to one of these, it's a there's a pretty good chance they have migraine. If they answer yes to two, there's a very, very good chance they have migraine. And if they say yes to all three, they almost for sure have migraine. Okay, so now what do you do? The patient has migraine and they've got eye pain. You've made the diagnosis. Their eye is quiet. It's not an ocular thing. So sometimes you can go above and beyond the call of duty and you can actually initiate treatment um, uh, if you want to. Like uh, sometimes, you know, people that, you know, don't have the time or the knowledge to do this, you can refer them back to their primary care physician or you can help them find an, a, 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 a neurologist to treat them. You don't have to, you don't have to treat the migraine necessarily, but if you want to, there's some really quick, easy things that you can do while the patient is waiting to get, get cause they're, they're suffering, right? They're having pain. You want to help them with their pain. So you can at least initiate treatment. You don't have to be in charge of taking care of their migraines. So the most common causes, you know, that I see in my comprehensive clinic is going to be, you know, one of the most common causes of eye pain is analgesic rebound. So these are people that have been taking Tylenol or Advil or something every day or almost every day for weeks and weeks. And that's um, uh, uh, sort of um, their, their pain gets in this vicious cycle where they can't get out of it. Um, opioids are especially bad actors in this uh, instance. Uh, you can recommend some over-the-counter analgesics. Uh, Alka-Seltzer is kind of an old remedy, but it, um, you know, it's kind of nice because it has bicarbonate of soda in it, so it can settle your stomach. So if you have nausea with a headache, it's nice for that. And because the aspirin is kind of dissolved in water, it, you can uh, absorb it more quickly. Um, you can use uh, Excedrin migraine, which is a combination of Tylenol, aspirin, and caffeine. There's usually generics available, you know, in every store. Uh, you can get into rebound with these as well. So you just have to warn people about that, not to use them more than like 10 or 12 times a month. Um, you can also use prescription migraine meds. You know, sumatriptan has been around a million years. It's really safe. The only real serious contraindication is if somebody has ischemic cardiac disease. Um, you can give them some metoclopramide, which in, in addition to treating the nausea kind of supports gastric motility and can also help resolve the migraine. And then, you know, uh, any more, you know, in my clinics, both neuro and general, a lot of people are just adverse to taking any kind of medication, even over the counter stuff. And so that's fine. You know, you, you can, uh, usually people will tell you that, or you can ask them that, like, you know, are you the kind of person who would rather take a medication or would you rather try to find something non, you know, medicinal? And they'll, they'll tell you. Um, you can recommend physical therapy for their head and neck. Uh, some people get benefit from seeing a chiropractor. You can uh, recommend massage therapy and acupuncture. All these things can, can be uh, um, helpful uh, in alleviating migraine in somebody who specifically doesn't want to use medical therapy. Um, you can also talk about lifestyle stuff. You know, the big um, um, things that I see in my clinic that people are bad about is not getting enough sleep. They're too stressed out and they're maybe drinking too much caffeine uh, or all three. So you can, you know, you can talk to them a little bit about sleep hygiene. You can talk to them a little bit about stress reduction with mindfulness or meditation. Um, you can talk to them about moderating their caffeine intake. These are all some easy, common sense, quick and dirty things you can do while the patient is waiting to get back into their primary care physician or, you know, waiting for a neurologist these days is like, you know, 10 years in the distance. Um, so uh, just real quickly, why does cervical paraspinal muscle spasm uh, manifest as eye pain? And, you know, this is not something I think you'll find in any paper or textbook. It's something I learned from Dr. Digri, but it, the, you might remember that one of the, the nucleus caudalis of the trigeminal nerve, you know, the trigeminal nerve is a gigantic nerve, right? And the nucleus, the nuclear parts of that nerve are all up and down the brainstem from the ponds to the medulla, but they, there's also part of this trigeminal nucleus caudalis that goes into the upper part of the spinal cord. And so it's thought that, you know, maybe if there's irritation in that upper part of the neck, you know, from a whiplash injury or, or somebody that's cranked their neck, jacked up their neck somehow, that maybe that irritates that trigeminal nucleus caudalis and again, causes referred pain 
into the eye and the eye socket or around the eye because of the, you know, the shared innervation of the eye and other parts of the, of the face and brain and meninges. Um, trigeminal neuralgia does not come up that often in my clinic, but you have to know about it because the treatment is way different and it's a way more severe uh, condition. It's, it's much more debilit, it can be much more serious and debilitating, even causing people to contemplate suicide sometimes. Uh, it, you know, there's some overlap there with um, um, other headache syndromes where, you know, the, the pain is just so severe because the trigeminal nerve is just so um, revved up. Uh, it's generally in people over age 50. There's, women are overrepresented in trigeminal neuralgia as well as migraine. You know, it's not super common. It's going to, again, be unilateral pain in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So it's going to be similar, you know, in distribution, but the character of the pain is what distinguishes it from other pain syndromes. Sudden, severe, stabbing, shock-like. You can see why people are really debilitated by it. Uh, but it can also be constant aching, burning sensation. So it's these neuropathic kind of symptoms, the stabbing, electric, burning kind of thing that's going to tip you off to trigeminal neuralgia. And it can coexist with migraine too, which makes things even more confusing. Uh, so these intense flashes of pain can be triggered by vibration or contact with the cheek. Uh, sometimes the wind will set it off, you know, just being out in the wind, shaving, brushing your teeth or chewing, anything that's, you know, kind of stimulating the trigeminal nerve can set people off. And again, these are things that distinguish trigeminal neuralgia from migraine, which can also be unilateral. Cluster headache also shares some similarity uh, with trigeminal neuralgia. It's part of a broader um, headache category called the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. And what distinguishes these headache syndromes, uh, again, from migraine is, um, uh, you know, it's again, unilateral head pain or eye pain uh, but it's accompanied by ipsilateral autonomic symptoms, which can be eyelid swelling or ptosis, tearing, a Horner syndrome, conjunctival injection, or a runny stuffy nose. So these are things when somebody's coming in with sudden acute stabbing, severe unilateral pain, I ask them about these autonomic symptoms because the, the treatment of cluster and these trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias is different from that of migraine. Um, when you're taking the history, you know, getting a personal or, or family history of migraine or headache is helpful. Asking them about new medications that they might have changed that might be setting them off. Asking them about social changes, like is there anything going on at work or at home or have they been in a car wreck? Um, one or always keep in mind giant cell arteritis. You know, that's another possible headache syndrome. And in the right, you know, demographic, you want to ask them the usual giant cell arteritis questions. Um, does the pain follow a specific dermatome of the face? Because that could tell you that it's a uh, zoster coming on or about to come on. And um, oh, and then this is a tricky one or, or corneal erosions because uh, just like uh, these other headache syndromes, the patient comes in, by the time the patient comes in, the erosion's gone, you know, and you look at their eye and, you know, and you can't find an abrasion or anything like that. Their eye just looks red and irritated and they're telling you the pain's getting better, just something to keep in the back of your mind, especially in some tip body with a basement membrane disease or a history of a corneal abrasion with an organic object. Um, something that I, uh, a little trick that I use in clinic uh, with somebody with eye pain is to put in a drop of preparacaine. And if that makes their pain go, if you're lucky enough that they're symptomatic while they're in your chair, if the pain goes away with topical preparacaine, you know it's some sort of surface thing. And then also you wanna you know, remember uh, shingles, which you know, this is a, I think none of us would miss this you know, shingles case down here in this slide, but sometimes it can be really subtle or it can be under the hairline and you have to kind of look around a little bit more. Um, so just always keep that uh, in mind. Uh, that can be a common cause of eye pain or pain in and around the eye, again, with a different treatment. You know, we're really lucky to have Dr. Harry, uh, you know, uh, in our clinic because he can use an orbital ultrasound to look for other rare causes of eye pain. If you're really stumped, like posterior scleritis is a, 
you know, one, it doesn't come up very often, but orbital ultrasound is like really almost the only way you can diagnose it. Um, an orbital pseudotumor, he can also look, you know, he looks at the lacrimal gland if you ask him and, and the extraocular muscles, and he can tell you if any of them are inflamed. Um, if you don't have a ultrasound person like Dr. Harry, um, you can, uh, sometimes these things will come up on a CT scan or an MRI. Um, orbital pseudotumor, you know, you can see uh, enlargement of the muscles uh, that involves the, the um, tendons. Uh, if you have sinus disease, especially sphenoid sinus disease next to the eye socket, that can sometimes uh, be present, present as uh, eye pain or eye socket pain. And then sometimes it's just cheaper and faster to send them to a neuro-ophthalmologist. You know, if you happen to be, if you're lucky enough again to be working in a clinic or a city where there's a neuro-ophthalmologist nearby, um, you, you might get more information out of a referral to them than, you know, ordering an MRI of the orbits and not really sure what you're looking for. Okay, so this was where like I was hoping to break us up into um, little groups where we could, um, where y'all could discuss these um, different cases that I put together after the presentation. But I don't know that there, let me see who we've got in the gallery. I'm not sure that we have enough people to like even break up into, into groups. Yeah, there's really not enough of us. So let's just, uh, let's see. Um, um, gee, Lydia, do you want to give this one a go? Just kind of talk about it out loud and um, um, and we'll kind of help you. Yeah, sure. Um, so 48 year old male with known metastatic prostate cancer comes in with four weeks of right eye pain and decreased vision. Um, on exam has decreased vision and APD ptosis, mild uh, up gaze, down gaze, oh, and some adduction deficits. Um, so if I was to see this patient, um, I think the most important thing is uh, in uh, my, my, should I go through this kind of in a all boards type of, like mock all boards type of presentation? Uh, just tell me what you're thinking, like what, you know, what things are you worried about with this patient and what would you do next? I mean, uh, what I would be worried about with anyone who has metastatic cancer, or any history of cancer would be that there is a spread to the orbit um, or to the eye. And I think that if he has decreased vision and APD ptosis and the restricted uh, restrictions, I would be nervous that there could be a met in his orbit. So the big important thing for me would be to, uh, of course, also, oh no, we got the vision, um, get a scan. Uh, I think a uh, MRI of the orbits and brain would be my first go-to uh, with and without contrast. and potentially go further with an ultrasound or other testing, but I think that would be the first thing to start off with. Of course, this could be um, also with the ptosis. Uh, I would make sure that this is not a harness because harness we would have to uh, think of uh, also some vascular issues, but I think that the MRI would be the first thing to start off with, as mm -hmm. well as, of course, some testing uh, for other common diseases that could cause decreased vision and uh, kind of uh, gaze restrictions. So I would also think, like, make sure he doesn't have thyroid or myasthenia or like anything sure. else. But I think that would be the first, my first workup for him. Right. Yeah. So a patient with a known history of cancer, they deserve a more careful history and a lower threshold for obtaining imaging. You know, especially if somebody that has decreased vision or evidence of other cranial nerve involvement needs special attention. Like this person sort of kind of sounds like they might have a third nerve involvement because there's mild up gaze, down gaze and adduction deficits. So yeah, this person needs, needs an MRI, the orbits, just like you said, great. Okay, so um, Tony, I'm gonna ask you to take this one on. Uh, this is a 75 year old woman who used to get migraines. 
uh, but she hasn't had them for years. And recently she began to have headaches, some proximal muscle aching and pain when she chews her food. A few weeks later, she suddenly went blind in her left eye. So I think this is a pretty classic presentation for giant cell arteritis, given that she has symptoms of polymyalgia rheumatica and some jaw claudication. And then on her fundus photo, you can see that the nerve has a waxy pallor with edema and or chalky white would be the best way to say it. And that would make me concerned for GCA. Great. Yeah, that's exactly right. And Again, this is going to be like overall, like thinking about all the people that are going to come into your clinic with eye pain, this is going to be an uncommon one, but a dangerous one. And so that's why it's emphasized so strongly in the OCAPs and the and oral boards and stuff. And it's, it's, you know, and it's one that still people still miss. And so, yeah, uh, that's why I brought it up. Great job. That was a quick question. Of course. There, there's something uh, significant on the photo of her external face there? No. It's just like, okay. just, just like it's, yeah. I should probably delete it actually. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay, so we learned about some red flags. Some people that had, in addition to their pain, they have some motility deficits or decreased vision, uh, or they have a swollen nerve, you know, anything like that is a red flag that means this is not the run of the mill eye pain patient that's migraine or cervical paraspinal muscle spasm or some other easy peasy thing. Uh, so more red flags, you know, would be worst headache of my life. That's, you know, one that we all learn about even in medical school because it can be a sign of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, also remember carotid or vertebral artery dissections can also cause head pain and pain in and around the face and eye. Um, venous sinus thrombosis would be a rare cause. And then there's these other, you know, um, uh, rare things, uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, and posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, you know, which kind of share some commonalities and maybe a common pathophysiology, but they can come on with decreased vision and sudden severe head pain. And, and those people, you know, need um, a brain imaging right away. And then just a quick shout out to intracranial hypotension. We think a lot about hypertension, but occasionally people will come in with headaches uh, from hypotension because they have a CSF leak is the most common cause. And um, those, the thing that's characteristic about that is that they're going to feel much, much better when they lie down and much, much worse when they get up and start moving. Again, these are all uncommon, but serious. And that's why we talk about them. Okay, let's uh, see who's in the, still in the gallery. Um, uh, Marshall, how about this one for you, please? Uh, sure. Uh, so there's a 23-year-old woman. It's unilateral throbbing eye pain with light sensitivity and nausea. Um, so uh, with a normal eye exam. Uh, so I would probably be most con uh, concerned about uh, uh, migraine in this case, uh, given the light sensitivity and nausea with a unilateral Throbbing eye pain is pretty classic, um, especially with the normal eye exam. Uh, might think about other things like optic neuritis and in in uh, this kind of presenting patient, but with a normal eye exam, um, that would be a lot less likely. Yeah, I agree. This is a classic case of migraine, but you know they've gone. So why does somebody with migraine go to the eye doctor? Right? It's um, it's a neurologic disease. The thing is, their eye hurts and you're an eye doctor. And so they assume there's something wrong with their eye, right? And that's why they've gone to you. So you don't have to fix it, uh, but you can at least say your eye is fine. I'm pretty sure this is migraine. I'm gonna send you back to your primary care physician, you know, and then you can choose to or not to talk about some of the, you know, treatment things that we talked about earlier in the presentation. Perfect. But your main job is to make sure her eye is okay. Make sure she doesn't have one of those red flag diseases and you can, you know, and then you can choose if you want to treat them yourself or send them back to their primary care physician. Oh man, this is a complicated one. Uh, so we're back to, I think we're back to Lydia. Oof, this is a lot to read. Sorry, I'm going to put it out. So a uh, 24 year old man presents for evaluation of intermittent vision loss. 
Pure Ports episodes that last 30 minutes, starting with a blind spot in the central vision that expands into the periphery and then dissipates. He is incapacitated, incapacitated during these spells. And if they occur while driving, he has to pull his car over. The blind spot has a colorful shimmering appearance. These spells occur about once every other month. And he's had three to four spells over the last six months. So this sounds very uh, typical for a migraine or that can happen without a headache. Yeah. Uh, since he doesn't complain of headaches, um, it sounds like a migraine or without a headache. But... I mean, he's 24 years old, so I'm less concerned for any uh, like amorosis fugax. But I think that things that should be on the differential are, of course, especially in an older patient, things like amorosis fugax and then uh, ocular ischemic syndrome, um, especially if it is light induced. But I think the presentation is very classic. Um, so what other questions? I mean, talking about a headache, uh, going through kind of the headache questions, risk factors, family history, um, if uh, like all the like different things, but more targeting the migraine pathway, um, photophobia, phonophobia, um, other associated symptoms. And then suppose the patient returns a day later, a year later and reports that the spells have become more frequent, more intense and longer in duration. Some of the spells are associated with weakness of the same side as the visual field defect and a recent MRI showed several areas of T2 hyperintensity. That would lead me more in uh, into the scheme of like an uh, MS type symptoms um, or like an uh, like demyelinating symptom uh, syn syndrome. Um, which of course is also on the differential for this. Uh, and I don't think I asked if earlier, if it's in both eyes or just in one eye, I think that's important to ask. Um, yeah, you know, and also, you know, I mean, it's rare, but young people can get mm -hmm. like carotid disease or cardiac disease. And so, you know, if you're seeing a bunch of T2 hyperintensity, you're absolutely right. That could be multiple sclerosis, but it also could be, um, you know, ischemic, you know, brain disease from, you know, from, from like a cardiac source or, or a carotid source. So somebody like that, you know, you might want to have a stroke specialist look yeah. at them and make sure they're not having little strokes that are presenting as something that sounds more, you know, that sort of sounds like an aura. So yeah. yeah. Uh, and then and the last the, the yeah. last one's tricky. Suppose in another scenario, yeah, I mean, early onset strokes and cognitive decline, I would think in the hypercoagulability uh, scheme, like I would think of uh, things like antiphospholipid syndrome, homocysteine, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the pronunciation of the word, okay. but I would get kind of a coagulation workup um, to make sure these are not like vascular strokes that uh, like strokes in the brain that cause the decline, um, as well as of course, like uh, Alzheimer's or other uh, like neurologic conditions. Yeah. Hey, Marshall, do you, does that ring any bells for you? Uh, family history of early onset stroke and cognitive decline? Oh, is it Susex? No. Something? That's not, that's usually not hereditary. Yeah, it's not. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, it makes me think of like vascular dementia, but I'm not sure what it's pointing to. Yeah. So it's another one of those uncommon things that sometimes shows up on tests. It's a uh, mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic oh, yeah. acidosis and stroke like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or it could also be a uh, catacil. Um, you know, those are the, the two inherited. So Milos and Catacil are kind of these two inherited syndromes that can, can present with vision loss and, and, um, uh, and headaches. Yeah. So it's just, it's one of those rare inherited things that sometimes pops up because it has this, uh, you know, because it has this distinctive, um, set of, you know, the history is so distinctive. Okay. That was a hard one. Let's see what else I've got. Can't remember. Oh, um, yeah, this is just to remind me that if you're, 
talking to somebody in clinic and you're thinking that what they're describing is a migraine aura, but you're not exactly sure, maybe they're not able to articulate, you know, what they're seeing. Um, you can just go on to Google images, you know, on your computer in the, in the room and, and you can just say migraine aura and you pop up with stuff like this and you can say, does it look like this? Does it look like this? You know, and sometimes, oh my God, it looks exactly what it looks like, you know, and then you know that you're, you're home free. Uh, there's also some really good pictures on the internet of people's impression of uh, visual snow, uh, which is, you know, usually a benign condition. It, it's more common in migraine people. There, there's usually a history that goes all the way back into childhood of having this, you know, static in their, in their vision. Um, but there are some rare, serious causes of, you know, late onset snow, but almost all of it's benign. Uh, yes, yeah, so we already talked about that. They perceive this as an eye problem or a vision problem, so they go to the vision doctor or the eye doctor. Uh, oh, just really briefly, I want to mention these uh, CGRP. Um, so calcium, uh, oh God, I'm spacing. Uh, calcium, calcitonin, G, calcitonin G-related peptide. I'm trying to remember what CGRP stands for. Calcitonin. You're right, calcitonin gene-related peptide. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not going crazy. Okay, so um, there's a lot that, thank you, Kathleen. There's a new group of medications that target uh, CGRP and its uh, receptors uh, for migraine. And so I just wanted you to be aware of them because they're, they're now very, they're on the market. I'm sure you've seen ads for them. Uh, so CGRP is a neuropeptide. That's why it's a target of, of uh, interest. In susceptible individuals, uh, you get CGRP release, uh, and it releases pro-inflammatory mediators. So that's why it was chosen as a possible target for headache or migraine treatment. Um, you get, and then when you get these pro-inflammatory mediators, you get further release of CGRP synthesis and release. So it turns into this vicious cycle that can last, you know, hours to days. You know, similar to you know the duration of a typical untreated migraine. And so that's why CGRP uh, was, um, uh, was studied for migraine and found to be a good target for migraine treatment. Um, it's a potent dilator of peripheral and cerebral um, blood vessels. Um, so that's another reason, you know, because it's, it's thought that cerebral blood vessel dilation might be part of the pathophysiology of migraine pain. Um, uh, CGRP is widely distributed throughout the body. You know, it's not just in the brain, it's in the respiratory, endocrine, gastrointestinal, immune, and cardiovascular system. So it's a widely dispersed molecule. Um, and interestingly, sumatriptan and botulinum reduce CGRP levels in a dose-dependent fashion in cell culture. So that's all kind of stuff pointed to CGRP as a possible target for, you know, migraine, um, pathophysiology. And so, uh, you know, it's thought that in a normal person, light, smell, and sound somatosensory inputs lead to, you know, normal releases of CGRP in the brain. But in a person with a predisposition toward migraine, it's thought that these same stimuli, which are normally not noxious to uh, people, causes a markedly increased release of CGRP. And that's what leads to the light and sound sensitivity, nausea, and pain associated with migraine. That's the kind of the hand-waving theory. Um, CGRP levels are elevated during a migraine attack, and CGRP is released after nerve activation. Um, uh, it appears to be involved in pain transmission. And interestingly, you can infuse CGRP into migraine people, and it'll induce a migraine attack. So. Uh, there's a, there are a, a group of CGRP antagonists on the market. They're intended for both prevention and abortive therapy. There's injectables and intravenous uh, molecules were the first to come out, but now there's some oral, um, oral uh, medications. They target either the CGRP molecule or its receptor. And these are some of the, you know, there's, there's more of them coming out all the time, but these are some of the ones you might see advertised on TV. I know I see a lot of Nurtech ads personally, uh, but these are all uh, preventatives and acute and trained and, and drugs for acute treatment of migraine that you might see. And Can I just uh, make a comment. Uh, 
the uh, you know Eptimizumab, uh, Fremonizumab, Galcanizumab, um, and uh, anyway, all of those, uh, Arinumab are all monoclonal antibodies. Um, whereas the G pants, uh, Ubrojapant and Remijapant are small molecule antagonists. Um, and then there's one more G pant that the Ubrojapant and Remijapant are for acute headache and Remijapant can be used every other day for prevention. And then there's a third one called a Tojapant, which is a daily medication, which is prevention. The good thing about these G pants is we don't think they have any cardiovascular um, factors. So in people who might have heart disease or uh, some cardiovascular problems, these small molecules may be something that could be used. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm not bringing this up because I expect you all to know how to prescribe these drugs and, you know, and they're extremely expensive and Insurance companies are very hesitant to approve them unless somebody's been has failed other medications. I just brought it up so that you're aware of what these drugs are, what they're called, how they work. You know, because your patients are some of your patients are going to be using them. Um, you know, we uh, showed in a, a study that we did with one of our former residents and fellows, Chris Kennard, that uh, chronic migraine is associated with reduced corneal nerve fiber density and symptoms of dry eye. So I can't remember, I think she had like a cohort of like 20 or some odd patients with chronic migraine that she did a confocal microscopy on. And they had these distinctive, you know, changes in their corneal innervation. And we're not sure if that's what's causing their migraines or if it's a effect of migraines or it's some sort of biomarker of migraines, but it was, it was, pretty, it was a pretty striking difference. And so again, there's, it's just showing that there's some connection between eyes and migraines and the trigeminal nerve. And then the other thing that was striking was that the, even though all of them in this particular cohort had normal Shermer's testing and normal tear breakup time, and you know they didn't have like a bunch of pigment epithelial erosion, I'm sorry, uh, punctate epithelial erosions in their cornea, um, they all, all of them, every single one of them of these patients with chronic migraine had symptoms of dry eye, you know, as, as shown on a dry eye questionnaire. Uh, we don't know, again, if that's a biomarker, if dry eye is like a biomarker of chronic migraine or chronic migraine causes you to have dry eye symptoms or if dry eye symptoms cause migraine. Like we have no idea which way the arrow is pointing or if it's pointing in multiple directions. But uh, uh, patients, uh, it, it does seem that if you do have a patient with um, chronic migraine, sometimes treating their dry eye symptoms can make some of their pain better. And it, it reduces some of the stimulus to the trigeminal nerve. And that's something I've been preaching to the neurologists, you know, because I think they're hesitant to prescribe eye drops, you know, even though they're over the counter and, but it's an easy peasy way that you can sometimes make people at least a little bit better with regard to their eye pain. Uh, we've also shown that patients with migraine have substantial reductions in their measures of visual quality of life. So there are these quality of life measures that are, you know, validated by and, and are part of the National Eye Institute questionnaire. And um, it turns out that these patients with migraine, what's driving their reduced, well, their perception that their visual quality of life is poor, it, it seems to be dry eye symptoms. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is another tough one, uh, but Tony, I think it's your turn. We'll help you. So a 42-year-old man reports periods of intense unilateral periorbital pain lasting 30 to 60 minutes. He's had a spell almost every day for the last week. The spells are accompanied by tearing. He has a selfie of his face from a spell in which he has mild ipsilateral ptosis. He had an episode of similar spells about a year ago, uh, but then had no spells until last week. What is the most likely diagnosis? And I think this is a cluster headache. Yeah. And the reason for that is because it's unilateral, one side is periorbital pain, pretty severe. <clears throat> and it happens almost every day, but still clustered in like a certain time frame within the year, like in a week or so. And then he also has tearing and swelling and ptosis. So you can have like a Horner's syndrome like picture with that. You can yep. have some 
uh, issues with um, uh, like tearing and rhinorrhea and even conjunctival injection and even eyelid swelling. Treatments uh, most effective for this order uh, in the acute phase, I think you can use like 100% oxygen. Yep. Uh, and um, outside of that, I am unsure, but I think you can also use some of the preventative medications that you do for migraines typically also. Mm -hmm. And then for food and beverage known to precipitate spells. Hmm, I actually forgot that one. I'm not too sure. Yeah, it's alcohol. Oh, okay. Okay. It can be a precipitant. Yeah. And does this patient need neuroimaging? And I, I do not think so. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and I think you could, you could, you know, you could interview ten neurologists, and they might. I don't know. I think most of them would image. Um, okay. You know, so I'd say it's it's a it's a toss up, but I'd say probably just because cluster is kind of kind of rare. You know, it's not super common. And I think, he, you know, he probably deserves one MRI. Uh, can this, Kathleen, uh, absolutely image the first attack. Um, it's one of the headache syndromes that's the highest secondary causes. Pituitary tumors, uh, cavernous sinus lesions, et cetera. Um, it, 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 you know, in migraine, if it's a normal exam, you never image because there's, you're not going to find anything. But in uh, any of the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, the first time you would image. Another uh, condition that can kind of mimic cluster that can come into ophthalmology is a uh, carotid dissection. And it can look because they get a little horners, red eye, yeah. uh, unilateral eye pain, and it can be very painful. Um, so, uh, so I would say most headache specialists, most neurologists would say on the first time you see somebody with a TAC, uh, you image. And remember, attack is a trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia. You know, we brought that. And that's something that does come up occasionally on OCAPs and boards. And again, it's not because you're expected to know necessarily how to treat these people, but um, you have to, you know, you need to be aware of them so you can at least make the diagnosis, get them to the right person to help them, uh, you know, get the right treatment. And again, they have eye symptoms. That's why they go to the eye doctor, even though it's a neurologic disease. Oh my God, another case. Uh, Marshall, your turn, please. Um, Six-year-old woman reports a continuous right-sided headache for the past three months. Um, occasional stabbing pain around the right eye lasting just under a minute. Uh, instead of tearing, she has nausea and photophobia. She has a selfie uh, showing a right-sided ptosis. Um, um, so this kind of sounds like hemicrania continua. Yeah, um, excellent. Given the continuous, Almost. um, uh, yeah. nature and the stabbing pain and the autonomic symptoms. Um, yeah. I think you can use like, uh, NSAIDs, like endomethacin, um, uh -huh. as a possible treatment for this. Um, and yeah. I think for the same reasons that Dr. Degree talked about, we should get at least one for him, her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's probably true. Um, no, you're right. It's it's not any NSAIDs though. It's 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 exquisitely and specifically sensitive to indomethacin. I don't know why, um, but but it but actually that helps. It's uh, indomethacin is not only therapeutic; it's diagnostic. You know, if somebody responds to indomethacin, then that sort of helps nail down the diagnosis of, of hemicrania. Excellent job, Marshall. Way to go. Um, this is a. Um, and uh, an abbreviation, no, it's not an abbreviation. It's a, it's not an eponym. It is a- Acronym. Thank you. The SNOOP acronym is one that they're real big on in, in neurology. So uh, if somebody's having headaches, you're supposed to remember this acronym to help you uh, decide if this is, you know, something serious and scary that needs imaging and other, you know, maybe some other workup or something that's probably benign. And so this is what SNOOP stands for. I have a ter I personally I have a terrible time remembering what SNOOP stands for, which is why I've got it written down on this slide. But uh, if 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 this works for you, then you know more power to you. But again, this helps you know helps you ferret out some of the things that we've talked about earlier, like giant cell arteritis or a subarachnoid hemorrhage, 
or you know a pituitary tumor or venous sinus thrombosis or some other you know scary bad thing that you know can be that can lead to serious morbidity and mortality. Um, that's the end of that. That's the end of that lecture with three minutes to spare. So let's take a 10 minute break. Everybody can mute and turn off their video. And then when we come back, we're gonna talk about uh, functional vision loss. Thank you, this was great. You're welcome. All right, let's uh, talk about non-organic visual disorders. Um, if you find the BCSC somewhat uh, lacking in terms of its description of functional vision loss and uh, what causes it and how to distinguish you know, malingerers from people that are just suggestible, um, this, is a, this is a short article written by one of the neuro-ophthalmologists um, who was at Iowa when I was resident, Stan Thompson. And um, it's just, it's a very easy read. It's, it's, it's written in a very conversational matter. It kind of gives you some background on the history of functional vision loss and sort of the spectrum of different kinds of patients that you see in functional vision loss. And some of the things you can do, you know, making observations in clinic and other tricks you can play in clinic to try to um, ferret out you know, functional vision loss or distinguish it from, you know, organic vision loss. And it's, it's in our file cabinet. I think it's also in the packet that everybody gets. And it's, I would just highly recommend it. I, I found it a really fascinating read when I was a, a resident. Okay, so here's a tough case. And I'm gonna have, see, I think it's just Lydia and Tony that are left. Let me look at the gallery here. Can I defer to Tony? Cause I may have to take over consults. I'm just trying to uh, mm. figure that out right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Tony, I guess you're up. All right, so differential diagnosis for these visual fields. Um, you can have glaucoma, you can have maybe a pituitary issue since there's, it's bitemporal. Um, it could be um, like, some sort of bilateral optic nerve issue, um, like a like something toxic or metabolic. Let's see. Good. What tests would you order to determine whether visual field loss is organic or non-organic? Uh, so we already did the visual field. Also look at the RNFL to see if there's any thinning of the nerve. Good. Uh, look at the OCT to see if there's, oh, of course there could be like macular issues since these appear to be uh, secocentral. So you can look at like an OCT, make sure it's not something in the retina. Um, you can do a MRI orbits and brain with uh, contrast to see if there's anything along the optic nerve, optic track, or if there's something more posterior to. Um, with the presence of normal pupillary reflexes, including the lack of a RPD, effectively rule out the probability of organic vision loss. Let me think about this real quick. So, <clears throat> um, no, it does not, because again, it could be in the retina, it could be something just in the macula. And if you don't have extensive retina disease, you might not have a uh, RAPD. And then if there is symmetric optic nerve issues on both sides, then there might not be a relative afferent pupillary defect. And then exactly. if, uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything post LGN that can look like this and not, not to my knowledge. So I'm not sure if there's anything cortical related that would, that could look like this though. What's the different, you know, you're exactly right. These are secocentral scotomas because remember this lady has 2040 best corrected vision. So what's the differential diagnosis for a secocentral scotoma? So secocentral, you can think of things affecting the, um, uh, what's it called? The papillomacular bundle. Yep. And in, in that case, is the, those fibers are very active. And so anything that affects uh, metabolic activity. So you can think of things like metabolic issues, uh, toxic 
um, exposures. <clears throat> um, you can think of things like LHON. Good. And, um, I wonder if autosomal dominant optic atrophy also looks like this too, something in the center. Uh, it could, but, but that's not at the top of my list, but yeah, it could, sure. Okay, and then that's what I got for now. I mean, also uh, uh, normal tension glaucoma can have um, central related defects too. How about in a patient who's undergoing cancer for uh, mycoplasma avium complex? Ethambutol? Yeah, thambutol toxicity can give you a secocentral scotoma. Um, yeah, those are good things to think about. The other things uh, that might go on that list, you know, you, you talked a little bit about a cone dystrophy, it could also be like um, CAR or MAR. So you'd want to ask the patient about a cancer history and about photopsias, which are pretty typical. Yeah, so that's no, that's a great, a great job. Um, you're right. You know, you pointed out that the defects look bitemporal, which kind of makes you think chiasm, but that's actually an artifact of testing because the the Humphrey perimeter does not uh, the in the the particular uh, 24-2 or 30-2 pr protocol that we use doesn't test the midline points and, and doesn't test like the points directly over the midline. So it can kind of make something that's seco-central look more bitemporal. That, that you brought, that's a really, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a great point. Um, so in terms of some of the different tricks that are described in you know, Dr. Thompson's uh, manuscript or in the BCSC, you know, there are um, a lot, many of them help you determine that the patient's not blind, like, you know, like using a rotating OKN drum or rotating a mirror in front of the patient. But that doesn't really tell you how good the vision is. And because you can have functional vision loss on top of organic vision loss, you really want, I think, to use a test that's going to um, tell you exactly how good the patient's potential vision is. And for that, you know, my favorite is the bottom-up refraction, where you put the patient behind the four-opter and start them on the 2010 line, and you have to really encourage them and coax them. And how many letters do you see? And can you just take, give me your best guess? That helps me, you know, run the dials back and forth to figure out how to make your vision better. And another good trick is using the red-green glasses, which is why I have this slide up. So um, the our um, um, acuity charts in clinic, you can put up, you can make them red and green like this. And then if you're wearing the red and green glasses, it will, you know, cause the vision in one eye to be black for, you know, one half of the um, chart and, and they'll be able to read the other half. And if they can read the whole thing, you can tell if somebody's um, doesn't really have vision loss in one eye. Uh, I always have to put the red green glasses on myself before I hand them to the patient to make sure I don't, you know, mix up which which I am trying to test. Um, also, the visual acuity screens in our clinics are polarized to reduce glare. And then if you, if you take the stereo vision glasses that we use to test um, stereo acuity with the fly, the fly book, um, it also will turn, because the, those, uh, the polarization and in, in in those lenses are at 90 degrees to each other, it'll turn the vision one eye black. Like if you put them on and try to look at the eye chart, one eye is completely blacked out and the other eye looks normal because the polarization is, is the same angle as the, as the screen. And again, I, have to, I can never remember which one is which. I always have to put the glasses on myself before I hand them to the patient to make sure I'm handing them the glasses either right side up or upside down, to, depending on which eye they're claiming vision loss in. Um, testing their stereo acuity actually is another clever way because, you know, in order to have a certain level of stereo acuity requires a certain level of vision. And that's something you can look up. There's a, there's a, I think it's on the internet. You can just Google it. Cause I can, again, I can never remember, you know, what level of stereo acuity corresponds to what level of uh, uh, visual acuity. Um, so there's, there's lots of, there's lots of different tricks out there. The important thing is just to find one that you're comfortable with and that you can do smoothly. You don't want the patient to think that you're doing something unusual or weird 
or that you know you don't want to you want to you want in their mind you want them to think that you're just doing your normal thing your normal routine the thing you do with everybody and so it's got to look effortless and smooth um, uh, in order to get the best cooperation from the patient so just pick something and stick with it Um, here's a trick uh, that I don't think is in the BCSE that you can use if a patient is claiming a visual field defect in one eye. So in this case, this patient is claiming a, a right, uh, you know, hemianopia in their right eye. Uh, their left eye is normal, so you know you don't have to worry about something, you know, behind the eye like a bitemporal lesion or a, or or you know, an occipital lobe lesion because it's only in one eye. What you can do is you can ask your perimetrist to repeat the test with both eyes open. And if they map, so if, if this was an organic lesion with both eyes open, since the left eye is normal, the visual field should be normal. So the bottom visual field should be full. So if they map that blind spot from their supposedly bad eye into the visual field that they obtain, that you obtain with both eyes open, um, uh, that, that, that tells you that it's non-organic or organic, you know, if, if the visual field defect disappears then you're like, well, gosh, I was wrong. You, there's really something wrong here. Um, you know, another trick you can do if somebody's just claiming a little central islands of vision, uh, this is talked about in the BCSC, you can, you, you know, I mean, it's almost a, uh, it's not, it's not easy to get a Goldman visual field these days. Here it is, we're lucky, but, you know, outside of an academic eye center, they're hard, it's hard to find a Goldman perimeter and someone who knows how to run it. But you know, the classic thing in functional vision loss with Goldman perimetry are spiraling fields or crossing of the eye softers. Uh, but you can also use a tangent visual field um, uh, if, if you don't have a Goldman perimeter. And so the idea here is that if somebody has a central island of vision that's X degrees wide, when you back them up from one meter from the wall to two meters, the angle of the of their vision should double to two x degrees. Uh, but people with functional visual field constriction will usually not expand their visual field when you back them up from one to two meters. Um, it's just a characteristic of non-organic vision loss, and so that's another quick and dirty way that you can do in just about any clinic if you suspect a patient's visual field constriction is, is functional. And that's something that I think we, we demo to our uh, residents uh, when they're in clinic, or at least try to. Um, so this is just a reminder that it can be really frustrating to take care of patients with non-organic vision loss because we're, as ophthalmologists, we're really trained to take care of organic vision loss. And so we find non-organic vision loss frustrating. Um, we feel like the patient is wasting our time, that they don't have an actual problem with their eyes and that they, you know. And the important thing to remember is that the vast majority of these people are not malingerers. You know, like I'd say out of maybe a hundred patients with functional vision loss I've seen, you know, over 20 years, one of them was a malingerer. You know, these are usually people that have some other psychological thing going on. They're stressed out at work, they're stressed out at home. Um, they're not getting any attention from their parents because they have a sibling that's sick and that's getting all the attention. Um, or maybe they have a minor thing wrong with their eye and they think that if they come in and tell you what their minor thing is, you'll blow them off because it's so minor. So they you know, sort of uh, amplify the symptoms to try to you know, get your attention. But the thing to remember is these all these people all have something wrong. It's just not necessarily an eye problem. Oh, the, actually, the most common cause in my clinic, I would say, is is chronic headache. You know, so these patients have chronic headache, and for whatever reason, I have no idea why, they come in with functional vision loss, and I think it's because nobody's treating their chronic headache, and their which is leading to anxiety and depression, which is making their headaches worse. Which is you know, it becomes this vicious cycle. And so then their psychological problems manifest as a physical problem. So these people all deserve care. They all deserve treatment. 
As an ophthalmologist, your number one job is to make sure there's not an organic cause for their vision loss, like in the first case we looked at, or, or that it's not organic vision loss on top, I'm sorry, non-organic vision loss on top of an organic problem. That's your number one job is to make sure nothing's wrong, which can be, you know, time consuming. And then the next thing is, you know, is that you have to, you know, take off your ophthalmologist coat and put on your doctor coat. And um, you have to address some of these things like get them into a neurologist to treat their chronic headaches or get them into um, uh, a mental health therapist uh, uh, to help with their depression or their anxiety or things that are going on at home or at school or at work. Um, so these people do have an actual problem. It's just not an eye problem. I have a quick question on this one. Yeah. So exactly like you were saying, and I've learned in the in previous at Iowa too, that there's a lot of times an underlying psychiatric issue, but I thought I just saw in the Stanley paper that you showed that um, that there is not really a psychiatric issue and would not recommend referral to a psychiatrist. I'm not sure if I saw that correctly. So I'm a little confused why he's uh, saying that. Um, so I'd say that most... Um, uh, most of the patients that I see with functional vision loss don't have an underlying uh, psychological problem. It's it's usually, like I said, chronic headache, or um, uh, but it, you know, you know, but it can be or eye pain. It can be. Gee, I'd have to go back and look at the paper and see exactly what Stan Thompson said. Um, it just depends on the situation. Um, I'd say that most of the time, these patients just need treatment of their chronic headache. Uh, but then, uh, like sometimes, like when a kid comes in with functional vision loss, you know, then I'll take the kid out of the room and just talk to the parents and say, you know, I, I really don't think there's anything wrong with your child in terms of an eye problem, you know, because of some of the tests I did were very reassuring. But, it, you know, sometimes, you know, um, kids can get a like what I would describe as a mental block, you know, they can't they, they can't access the vision that they have. And it's usually because something's going on at home. And then the parents will say, often they'll say, yeah, you know, um, we, we kind of thought that there wasn't anything wrong with their vision either because their behavior, their visual behaviors are normal. Um, and it turns out that parents are getting divorced or there's another kid in the family that's sick or, you know, or there's, you know, three families living in one house or some, something like that. And so then, then you just kind of have to put it back in their court to do what they can to help solve the problem. You know, but sometimes it is um, uh, depression or anxiety or some others or, a, or an actual psychiatric disease and they do need to see a mental health professional. So it just depends on the situation and you just have to ask a few probing questions. Um, so I'd, I'd say if that's what it says in Stan Thompson's paper, I'd have to go back and look at it. But um, yeah, it just depends on the situation. Um, so now what I was going to do is I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to bring up some videos to look at. Uh, um, we can talk about, so let me stop my share for a minute. Okay, so this is a video from uh, the novel collection that uh, Dr. Degree did with her uh, partner in crime, Dan Jacobson, when she was a fellow at Iowa. This is somebody who's uh, reporting uh, difficulty with focusing and uh, eye movements and tracking. Um, did we lose Lydia to consults? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Brandon and, is sick, and so she has to recover. <laughs> so are you the sole survivor? I am, <laughs> but I'm all for it. I'm here. Okay. So what do you think of this patient's video? Yeah, so uh, there's some eye, eye fluttering and associated with 
eyelid fluttering too, as well as some, hey, can you play one more time? I think there might've been some periorbital, um, like, I don't know if there's some grimacing, but muscles, let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, the thing that really trips me up is the, the eyelids. And so that all points towards a more voluntary type of nystagmus, which I actually have seen myself before too. Oh, cool. From what I understand, this is more along the line of a functional issue rather than a, um, a organic problem. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Um, let me queue up the next. Of note on that patient, that was a resident, an ophthalmology resident, when I was a fellow who could do this at will anytime he wanted to. Wow. And if you look at the end of the video, uh, his eye really, I mean, I, I even know his name, uh, but but he was a he was an eye resident when I was a fellow at Iowa and uh, it was really fun that he could do that party in his tag. Uh, I have a quick question on that one. Can accommodative spasm look anything like that at all? Almost like, I don't know, if borders align between voluntary and not when they're just trying so hard to focus on something that it produces this voluntary nystagmus look. Um. I really don't think so. Um, I mean, convergent spasm, which we're going to talk about in a minute, can be, um, you know, can be organic, but usually not. But accommodative spasm. I, I meant convergent spasm. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I think that people that can do that voluntarily do sort of use convergence somehow, some way to induce the the fluttery movements. But um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that. Um, at least in my experience, somebody with like asthenopia, you know, like somebody that's having difficulty reading, you know, doesn't end up going into um, a flutter like that. No, I don't think so. Okay. The only reason I ask is because I saw this one patient on call who was reporting like dramatic vision decrease, young male um, who's denying any stressors, but his parents says he, he was having some. And that was the only finding that I saw where he was having these fluttering eye movements, but with uh, eyelids also. He came back into a neuro clinic, Eric and I saw him. Mm -hmm. and at the end, we decided that it was most um, consistent with convergent spasm and or, along with uh, accommodative spasm. So we gave him some, we cyclo bleached him and he, it actually made him way better. And he was super happy with that. Oh, oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah, and so that's what we had him on. He was very happy to see that his vision got better, that he wasn't accommodating so much. He was just eating up the, the um, when we were trying to uh, refract him, he was just eating up the power, just kept uh, accommodating over it. Huh, so were they, was it a latent hyperope or? He was not actually. Okay, he was emetropic. Yep. Uh, but felt better after psych, yeah. Oh, well, no, that's something I've never seen. So yeah, I, I, that's great. I guess that's part of the differential. When you see somebody doing that, you know, is that they're um, that they're going into an accommodative spasm. Interesting. Cool. Okay. Uh, now we're gonna go. So this is a uh, different. This is from Shirley Ray, who's a neuroophthalmologist at Mass Eye and Ear, Harvard. And it's similar to the last case, but there are some important differences. So for this, I'm seeing these horizontal episodic um, flutter movements, and it, they don't seem to have a particular pattern in them. They seem to come, go, and then there's like pauses in between them that make me think that they are, it's not, doesn't seem to be sustained. 
Right. There are some eyelid, there's some blinking associated with them too, a couple of times. Um, but that's the most I can pick up. Yeah. So the things, yeah, I, I agree with you. The things that are like differentiate that video from the prior one are it's not continuous or these little bursts of back to back saccades. It's like the eyes go right, left, right, left, right, left, and then they stop. And you don't see that spasmy, squinty eyelid movement like we saw in the first uh, video. And so when you see those little, you know, very intermittent back to back uh, saccades without any accompanying eyelid movement or, or, you know, any of that squinty converging kind of movement, that can be, that actually can be an organic problem, uh, like a perineoplastic disorder. So I just brought up those two videos to kind of show the difference between what a voluntary nystagmus looks like and then a similar ocular flutter, which can actually be something more serious and, you know, and needs, you know, further workup. It's, it's involuntary. Okay. So those, those blinks that I saw are probably just her blinking normally. Is yeah, that right? I think okay. so. Whereas like in the first video, the guy is kind of like squinty and his eye movements were kind of fluttery when he's doing, it's almost like his eyelid movements are synchronous with the buzzy back gotcha. and back, back to back and forth movements of his eyes. That makes sense. Okay. Last video. So this is a this is another film from novel from Shirley Ray's collection at Mass Pioneer in Harvard, and this is a 17 year old kid who's also complaining of eye pain, difficulty focusing, and difficulty moving his eyes. He saw an outside ophthalmologist who diagnosed him with bilateral sixth nerve palsies. And you can see that he does seem to have trouble abducting each eye. His elevation and depression are normal. But it's weird because like sometimes his eyes look like they're moving normally as here when they when one eye is covered. And you can see that the left eye can clearly abduct. And here you can see that the right eye can clearly abduct when, the, when each eye is covered individually. But when he has both eyes open, he just can't seem to abduct or has a lot of trouble abducting. And also it's a little hard to see in the video, but there's some, the pupils are constricting too sometimes when he's asked to, he makes these weird movements. Like he can like move the eyes like independent of each other. Like his, yeah. What would you think of that video, Tony? Spasm of the near third or near triad, is that right? Spasm of the near, yes, convergent spasm, yeah. Yeah, so what's happening is when, you know, and it, whether or not it's voluntary or involuntary, that's, you know, not for us to decide. But, um, uh, but when he's being asked to move his eyes to the left or right, he's converging his eyes and that's sticking them in, you know, so that one eye goes in towards his nose and then the other eye, doesn't seem to be able to abduct. But you know, the really telling thing is that when you cover one eye and ask him to move each eye individually, you know, the eye moves fully. So you know it's not a sixth nerve palsy. And then the other thing that's, you know, can be difficult to look for, especially if somebody has brown eyes, is, you know, are the pupils constricting when you're asking them to move their eyes back and forth. And and, and that's the tip off. Uh, you will not, you know, that will differentiate that from something more serious. So there are some organic um, causes of convergent spasm. Uh, gee, there, it's like Wernicke's, I think you can see it. Um, some like uh, space of the skull things, you know, at the junction between the brainstem and the, you know, the upper spine. 
you know, the, the same place like where you, where you would see a Chiari or other things that cause downbeat nystagmus can also cause conversion spasm, thalamic hemorrhage, you know, weird stuff like that that's really rare. But the thing that's going to differentiate those organic causes from non-organic plain old conversion spasm is the cupillary constriction, you know, and, um, and the lack of other neurologic signs and symptoms. Um, treating conversion spasm, that's a whole nother kettle of fish. Um, that can be difficult. Sometimes using dilating drops like you were describing, Tony, with the patient that you saw with Eric, sometimes that can be helpful. Sometimes it's just an asthenopia thing and they need reading glasses or they're a latent hyperope and they need prescription glasses. Um, uh, but sometimes it can be really tough to treat. Sometimes it's a psychological thing. You know, that they're stressed out, they're drinking too much caffeine, not getting enough sleep. So there's, there's a bunch of different uh, things that can cause it and different ways to try to get rid of it. But it, it can be difficult, especially if somebody's been doing it for a long time. Well, it looks like uh, we're done early. I had, I don't think, let me look, but I don't think I had anything else in my presentation. Let me just look real quick. So it was a very popular topic. I really enjoy non-physiologic vision loss and non-physiologic eye movements. And I've seen some people with non-physiologic ptosis and obviously there's occasional person who puts drops in their eyes and stuff. You know, there's all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. I think it's always important to start to, to think about that. You know, you want to assume physiologic and, you know, prove non-physiologic. And that's the, one of the huge advantages that we have. And, neuro ophthalmology is that we're not just, you know, well, that doesn't look right to me and just saying that the person is crazy, but, you know, like with seizures or movement disorders, but we can actually prove. I think one of the really tricky ones for me is um, the flutter and the convergent spasm kind of stuff. Uh, and I think it's really, really important to make sure that you look carefully at vertical eye movements because, you know, you don't want to miss a pineal tumor or something like that. Um, some people will actually have convergent spasm with medical issues like calcium disorders and hyperventilation, uh, you know, uh, uh, pulmonary disorders. Um, so sometimes it's a, it can be a physical manifestation of, a, of an actual medical disorder. But I think as Brad pointed out, those are, those are really, really rare. So, uh, Judith, what would you say to uh, Tony's question about referral to a, uh, a mental health Professional. professional. Well, that's a really, really great question. And I don't know if you went to the whole session on um, non-physiologic. They've actually decided, uh, they, you know, they have decided um, that functional, functional disorders are a real thing, which is a little bit tricky because um, functional was sort of in the physical therapy wor world, just kind of used as a description of this is the functional disorder you mean like the functioning disorder, but they've decided to use the term functional disorder, meaning that it's that kind of sort of brain neurological disconnect. And it was actually a very, uh, very controversial session because the um, psychologist, uh, Dr. Staub from Mayo was basically saying that it's all physiologic um, and uh, that um, that you that that um, how was he putting it, Kathleen? It was really it was really difficult. And you know, the, the, all of the neuroophthalmologists in the audience were basically saying, like, you know, because somebody gave a talk on you know non physiologic stuff, and the 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 audience was just going nuts of like, well, but it's not real. And yeah, but uh, we, his we are the was... gatekeepers of real, you know. I know, but his point was that there is some kind of brain pathway that allows for these kinds of things to happen, like the convergence spasm or whatever. It's, let's say it's non-physiologic. I mean, we like the term non-physiologic because it tells us that it's not based in some pathway. But his point was that all of this is based on some pathway. Uh, it's just an aberrant way of demonstrating the path pathway or the for the person. 
So, so it, it was it was very uh, unsatisfactory for uh, for many neuro ophthalmologists because it, it it started to disturb their worldview. Very much so. But anyway, the an the answer to your actual question is I definitely um, have the talk with the parents, um, with the associated people. I think that in some cases you really can identify a clear secondary gain, um, in which case, you know, I can be quite um, uh, blunt um, with them. But uh, most of the time, I think the vast majority of the time, people are either innocently suggestible or that, that this is a, a physical manifestation of a psychological disorder. And I feel like I am not doing my job as a physician if I just, just say, oh, it's okay, dear, pat on the hand. I feel like it's really important to get them into a uh, mental health professional. And um, you know, I think, it's, I think that's important to have a, a one or two mental health professionals that you can uh, work with. And I've had really good luck with that. Um, uh, my, my most recent really severe uh, conversion spasm, I think I might have even sicked her on you at one case, Brad, but she was just terrible, terrible. And I just uh, um, uh, uh, looked in on her psych notes and she is, she's doing so much better. And, you know, they identified some really, really significant stressors that had kind of been blown off by patient and mom. But I think, I think that, you know, as a, as a professional um, and making this kind of diagnosis, it is, it is your obligation to, to refer to a mental health professional, be that, you know, a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, usually psychiatrists, not much use. I would be much happier with a cognitive behavioral psychologist. Yep. CBT is, I, pro I think, probably going to turn out to be, if it's ever studied, probably the best route for these folks. CBT is because it's not all sort of, you know, let's talk about your mother stuff. It's more like, okay, how are we going to do a practical thing this week? Report back to me how you did. And, you know, then we're going to work on the next thing. And, um, you know, but at the same time, an incredibly supportive environment for them. Yeah. And I would just say that follow-up is important too. You know, you don't want to discharge the patient from your clinic. If you, when you make a diagnosis of functional vision loss, you want to make sure they get better and that you're not missing something organic. Kathleen, any, any final thoughts before we sign off? No, this, I, I think functional visual loss is one of the most challenging things we do. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, and, um, and I like, I think it's, I think your point that we follow them until they're better is a good one. Okay. Tony, thanks so much, so much for uh, doing all those cases with us. It was a lot of fun and I hope you have a great weekend. A lot of times, a lot of times they don't get better. They just choose a different non-physiologic thing to work with. They move, they move from your uh, blurred vision to unexplained abdominal pain. And, you know, then they're seeing somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, uh, you know, and I, I want to underscore Judith's comment about CBT. Uh, that has been studied in migraine, not so much chronic migraine, but episodic migraine. Uh, uh, they compared people doing and it also this showed up in kids uh, in that big study the champ study uh, that cognitive behavioral therapy was as efficacious as preventative migraine medication yeah yeah and we do I think uh, that's an important point and just a quick plug for the utah center for evidence-based treatment this is a good way to get people plugged in with a cbt therapist so it's a good resource for the patient okay thanks again tony Thank you.